Hi, just one moment. I'm gonna situate really quick. Okay, thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here today and share a little bit about what um, NREL and our program partners have been up to, and especially in terms of covered building spaces. Um, one moment. Um, thank you. So my name is Isabel Langua Romero. Um, I work at NREL and lead the building performance standards, um, technical assistance, and applied research. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Wonderful. So um, today, you know, this is just kind of a um, baseline setting, but um, covered buildings, lists, as most of you here probably know, are just a list of all the properties that will be included. Um, maybe some extras that aren't included yet, but uh, maybe included in the future um, for your energy um, and building related policy such as benchmarking and building performance standards. Um, we'll definitely review today some of the critical property level information that you need in that first iteration of a covered buildings list. Um, and then as well, kind of the, um, the lifetime of them. So, you know, we can really think about covered buildings list as a living document. Um, and over to the right, I just have a screenshot of, um, you know, one of those um, lists in place and that's on the seed platform. Um, next slide. Um, so before we get into some of that data management information um, and, you know, the kind of particular information needed in the covered buildings list, um, it's, I thought it might be nice to kind of ground um, some of the ground us and this conversation in the complexity of building, uh, building information, building data. Um, so we have here kind of in case A, a one-to-one -one relationship. So you can think of a one building on one tax parcel and one address. So when you're thinking about matching and merging a bunch of properties together, um, especially at the state level, um, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty simple one-to-one uh, -one relationship. But when you think about, um, you know, for example, in case D in the bottom right corner, um, that can get pretty tricky when you're merging different data sets together. So for example, in case D, we have building five, um, which is across multiple different parcels has two different addresses, has common parcels with other properties as well. And so when you think about um, kind of the complexity of mapping and merging data from different sources, um, you really need to have something to string that building across different types of data sources so that you can map and merge a bunch of properties together. Um, so when you think you know, about getting information from both the tax assessor data, um, you and maybe an internal document, um, it's good to have kind of a unique ID, which will lead me to my next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so unique building identifier, uh, identifiers are really, really critical. Um, I know, I'm sure all of you are <laughs> very well familiar with this, um, but the DOE has funded through Pacific Northwest National Lab, a unique building identifier tool, which does create kind of a two-dimensional um, representation of, for example, something like a building footprint. Um, it assigns it a code string. And so this gives you the opportunity uh, to create a unique um, ID that can help you map and merge across, um, <laughs> I'm writing, that can help you map and merge across both ta multiple tax parcels, multiple addresses. Um, and I'm sure as you know, addresses are kind of uh, tricky for um, merging, so unique identifiers are really um, kind of our suggested solution to that. Um, you can have multiple different um, identifiers as well, and often jurisdictions do we do see them use multiple identifiers. Um, gives you a kind of a backup to cross-reference buildings and to identify them. Um, so, for example, Energy Star Portfolio Manager is definitely um, widely used um, industry standard for benchmarking. Um, you can now include uh, the UBIDs within Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So whatever kind of management tracking software you're using uh, to uh, kind of run these building, pro building performance standards or benchmarking programs, um, when you're bringing Energy Star Portfolio Manager onto that um, data into that platform, 
um, you can, and you've created the covered buildings list and that's already loaded in your platform, um, that data can kind of stream, stream, be streamlined uh, to the correct property. Um, something else we see is the creation of city specific or state specific jurisdiction specific IDs, um, and then kind of a search engine on websites so that a building owner can uh, correctly find their specific properties ID. Next slide. Um, so just kind of starting with kind of the main uh, bare bones of what's needed in that first iteration of a covered buildings list, address, gross floor area, building owner contact information, and then that building or custom ID is really um, kind of the first four critical pieces of information that need to be in a covered buildings list. And like we said earlier, these are living documents. Um, so maybe in that next iteration, you're looking at things like year built, um, latitude and longitude. And I have an asterisk here because um, latitude and longitude can often be um, gathered from address via geocoding services, some which are free, some which are not. Um, we can get into that um, today as well. Um, and then occupancy type, number of buildings, building name, last renovation. These are kind of some of the first pieces of information that we've seen through the um, DOE um, Building Performance Standards Technical Assistance Network that a lot of jurisdictions are um, kind of first starting with. Um, all right, next slide. Okay, so kind of thinking through some of the sources for the CBL generation, um, we kind of break it up initially by the ownership of the buildings, whether they're publicly owned or jurisdiction owned or whether they're privately owned. Um, so for jurisdiction owned buildings, there's a lot of internal public records um, and department documents that can be sought. sought. Um, so for example, I was working with Louisville, uh, city of Louisville a few months ago, and their affordable housing programs had, um, you know, they dug up a bunch of different CSVs that were um, provided them a lot of building specific information, um, contact information, um, voucher information about the affordable housing stock. And so that was used to kind of supplement their covered buildings list. Um, for privately owned buildings, um, city, <laughs> city, county tax assessor, um, or parcel data is where we see a lot of people go. Um, it's definitely a time consuming process to request all those things. Um, and then beyond that, a lot of the commercial real estate databases. That can be things in particular like CoStar that we've seen a lot of jurisdictions by. Um, and those are, um, it's also not always the best. Um, if you, um, I'm sure you're familiar, but it's, it can be very expensive. Um, so just wanted to highlight two other use cases here, condominiums. Um, so in particular, if you're thinking about, if you have to look at a policy and think about whether individual condo owners will be uh, required to comply or an entire property will be um, required to comply and how you um, create a covered buildings list may or may not kind of hold some of that information. And then multi-use buildings as well. Um, so we have here, here kind of a recommendation of looking into the Energy Star Portfolio Manager glossary to kind of help define that prominent use type for multi-use buildings. Next slide. Um, so one of the things we see, you know, with the tax assessor data is that it takes a long time and I'm sure to request that information to get it back um, and then create a covered buildings list using that data. And so one of the things that DOE has funded um, NREL and other labs to do is help provide some kind of assistance on, um, you know, kind of a shorter pro or a kind of a, a process for identifying a, or creating a covered buildings list in the interim. Um, that tax assessor data can then be um, fed into. And so that's what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on here um, talking about. So some of the um, additional data sources that we've been looking into at NREL are Microsoft Building Footprints, Open Street Maps, and then any publicly available data on ArcGIS. Um, we can go to the next slide and I'll talk through a little bit about that workflow. Um, so one of the things that NREL has created this next, um, this past year is kind of a, an open source GitHub repo, <laughs> GitHub repo, and we're calling it the CBL workflow. So it helps kind of, there is definitely some technical background I'll mention um, that's needed here, but 
it is open source as well. And so all of the um, people who end up using this can share information back and streamline this workflow for others to leverage as well. So it's um, kind of in line with our open source ideas. Um, but the workflow is kind of normalizing address, geocoding these addresses via MapQuest or other geocoding services. Um, an example of another geocoding service, um, you know, many of you may have ArcGIS departments. ArcGIS Pro does have geocoding services as well. Um, from there, you download the Microsoft building footprints for all the areas encompassed by the geocoded coordinates. Um, you find the intersecting or closest geocoded coordinate and generate a UBID, um, which is that tool that we talked about earlier out of PNNL that creates that 2D representation of um, the footprint. And then from there, you export the resulting data to a CSV or GeoJSON file. Um, and I'm, I would also just mention too, um, you know, UBID can be used both and you know, and I'm happy to take any questions about this, but UBID can also be used to, um, can be used like on the same property. So you can create two different UBIDs um, from two different files, for example, for the same property, if you'd like, and then determine the degree of overlap using a Jacquard index. So that's sometimes a mapping and merging kind of process that we see um, jurisdictions use. Next slide. Um, and then here, I know um, you guys saw some of these resources earlier, but um, we had the covered buildings list guide that was recently created. And then we have a link to the um, GitHub repo. And, you know, we hope that this, um, you know, in the next year or so that we're going to be developing this out to be kind of a tool that will be streamlined with something like the seed platform so that, um, so that jurisdictions can kind of seamlessly create their covered building list and import that into a platform that they're using to manage the, um, the policy as well. Next slide. Oh, it uh, looks like something got left on there. But, um, you know, we're just, I was also wanting to kind of briefly talk about leveraging covered buildings lists for equity portfolio prioritization, um, EPP. And so really this is about kind of tagging up each individual property with local equity information so that you can filter and focus in on individual buildings of within your covered buildings list um, that need to be prioritized for whatever reason. And so those character characteristics can really vary. Um, we had a few, I have a few that were listed out here. You can see some of them, affordable house, whether property is an affordable housing unit, whether it's a human service provider um, for um, in the tenants, as well, and then whether it's in a White House defined disadvantaged community census tract. And so all of that information using the unique building ID, whether it's the UBID or an individual um, kind of jurisdiction defined ID can help us kind of map and merge um, the relevant equity information at the property level. Next slide. Um, and then here, just kind of highlighting the connection between um, cover buildings lists and software that we've been kind of touching on throughout this presentation. Um, so whatever software jurisdictions decide to go with, um, it's really important that we can, um, that those are able to manage and maintain the complex building um, data that we've been discussing. So multiple years and cycles of information, um, continued importing of new data, but keeping that um, keeping a record of the individual files that were uploaded um, as well so that you can continually look back over um, history of one property record and see what types of files were imported. Um, the building and parcel data relationship. Um, something else that we're seeing come up in a number of jurisdictions are district energy system policies. So the data integrity for your covered buildings list on knowing which buildings are part of a, di a district energy system this is something um, that NREL at least is gonna be working on, developing out on the seed platform these next years, um, next year or so. And then the campus style buildings and census tracts as well. Next slide. Yeah, so um, kind of a brief presentation. I wanted to make sure that um, I left enough time for us to kind of 
go over any questions or comments that you all had and um, kind of root the conversation based on where jurisdictions here are. Um, you know, the creation of covered buildings lists are really dependent on where you're starting from, what data you have access to as well. There's not a one size fit all um, kind of workflow for creating these, um, these lists. So I'm happy to take any questions and open it up to you guys as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Isabel. Um, it's great to see that there are increasingly um, what I understand to be like open source tools for a lot of states to use, um, where you know previously maybe a lot of the states that are um, deep in implementation of BPS uh, might have gone for other routes or like expended some resources and investments to build out. Um, and you know, I welcome any of those folks to chime in, but I guess where my head is at right now is like, if they have, if, you know, certain states have already a process built out, how like difficult is it to adopt um, something like this UBIT workflow or um, the seed template if they're, you know, using other software? Um, so I, I can, um, speak to that. So, I, the software that you choose, that a jurisdiction chooses, wouldn't um, keep them from being able to leverage the GitHub repo workflows that we've mentioned, nor the UBID. So they could. It's really kind of tool agnostic. We know that um, jurisdictions need to find whatever software solutions make the most sense for them. So we're, you know, we're definitely in the business of um, creating solutions that work. Um, flexibly for whatever is best for jurisdictions. Um, I think I understand that question correctly, but um, feel free to rephrase if I, if I didn't. Yeah, that gets to it. Has anybody on the line um, used UBITs already in the implementation of their policies? Maybe this could be a, a yes in the chat if you have. Yeah, I'll speak to that. Um, New Jersey actually did use um, UBIDs for the first and second um, implementing year. How did it work for New Jersey, if you have a sense of that, Alexis? Yeah. Um, it worked pretty well. I will say there were some issues regarding um, some of our state energy facility campuses specifically. I'm just trying to match, you know, the correct UBIT information for a parent versus child property, um, going into portfolio manager, and also, you know, if, um, what some of those properties were master metered, you know, how is that broken up versus ones that are maybe multiple meters for different buildings on the campus. So that's, that's some of the struggles we've had with it. Great. Yeah, it seems like um, there are still steps to fully streamline the mapping process, but this is a great first step or first tool to attempt it. Um, and I see a few things in the chat here. Virginia was saying, we're planning to use them in Minnesota, but we haven't started the covered buildings list yet. Ron concurs for Hawaii. Um, and then Steve is asking, how have other states that are farther along identified their covered buildings? And so that that does get to one of the questions we were posing at the very beginning, which maybe zooms out a bit or like, you know, goes truly back to step one of um, determining eligibility of covered buildings. Um, Isabel, do you have any suggestions, you know, after working with certain jurisdictions that may have already had benchmarking data um, from like existing ordinances uh, for tackling like, you know, defining the parameters as a first step of like what would constitute a covered building? And then, you know, even from there, like establishing a performance threshold. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, 
at least for the creation of the gen the covered buildings list, often the technical assistance we perform is not necessarily on um, like determining which buildings are are going to be included or not. Um, more on the technical background side of how do we support like kind of quality assistance and um, assurance for existing buildings from the perspective of you already have benchmarking data. Um, you most likely have from that reporting a list of all the properties that are going to be included um, in the in the ordinance. So it's the question, how do you determine kind of after that what additional properties to include or like the threshold for which properties to include? Yeah, um, so I think there's a good bit of kind of internal research probably on what the energy usage is, what the like, you know, performing impact analyses to determine, um, you know, both cost and energy impact analyses if you have, you know, city or statewide goals, um, how they coordinate um, in terms of reaching those goals and what built based on the current and existing and historical energy usage of those properties, how you could reach those targets. And so there's um, there's different approaches for target setting, whether that's BPS or um, um, for benchmarking. I you know I think a good bit of people tend to start with the kind of largest energy emitting buildings um, or emissions buildings, um, especially in the commercial space and then large, large multifamily. Thanks, um, Isabel. Yeah, I, I realize those those are kind of like separate questions that of, you know, designing a covered buildings list based on, you know, the technical uh, aspects of accessing the like building footprints as opposed to like who is excluded or included. Um, those are kind of separate considerations. Um, Joanna, I think you you added something interesting in the chat here about how DC um, approaches developing a CBL. Do you want to share off mute? Sure. Yeah. Um, we have definitely done a lot of work with UBIDs, but we have not fully transitioned, <clears throat> excuse me, over to using UBIDs. What we have is like our version. We call it the DC unique ID. It's typically an eight digit number. Um, and that comes from our office of tax and revenue. So when we create our covered building list every year, we're basically pulling public records from a number of different sources um, and kind of combining all of it so that we have the building owner information, building address and uh, basic information are about, you know, what kind of building it is. And of course, most importantly, the size of the building, which is how we determine whether or not it's covered by our benchmarking and BEPS laws. Um, and with each of those like plots of land, essentially, it's associated with a square suffix or lot number, which is that eight digit ID. Um, it's usually a one-to-one -one, as in there's one ID for one building. There are, of course, circumstances where there are multiple individual buildings that share one tax lot, or sometimes there are even cases where one large building spans more than one tax lot. So that's where a little bit of like, that's where kind of just staff time comes in and, and determining, um, you know, when we receive our submissions, how we pair those portfolio manager IDs with our covered building list that we've uploaded into uh, our database. Awesome. Thank you for that additional context. Isabel? And, yeah, I was just going to respond to, to that. I think um, the workflow of maintaining your own local custom ID makes a lot of sense. Um, UBID can all, I would say, you know, doesn't preclude you from using UBID kind of as a tool for the mapping and merging process of um, of properties. So maybe you have multiple different data sources and UBID could be put um, so like, let's say you're getting two different S CSV files and you need to merge those together. And the only, only common way based on the data that's in those CSVs to merge them would be on address, which um, as we saw in that, in the, one of the images in my presentation, it address can be, you can have multiple different addresses for one property um, or built reporting building. And so you, you may want a geospatial identifier to merge on. 
So if you created two U bids for, for each of those addresses or for all the properties in each of those different CSV files, you can merge the two on the degree of overlap that the unique U bids have as well. Um, I know that, I don't know if that's kind of a, a mouthful or a head full as well, but um, you know, you could, if you go, yeah, if you go back one slide actually, Yeah, so if you created, um, you know, you have two different CSVs, and if you're looking at case D here, maybe CSV file one has address nine listed for building five, but address uh, CSV file two has address 12 listed as the address for building five. If you created a U bid with the same kind of lat long and centroid that building five has, um, then you could, um, you know, you put that U bid that has an association with the lat long into both the CSV file that has address nine and 12. And then there's a jacquard index that will kind of show you and merge if there's a degree of threshold of overlap for those two. Um, so sometimes, you know, it can be used kind of functionally like that to create the covered buildings list or in the process, but you could still be using that unique custom ID um, from the city or state perspective as your kind of reporting mechanism ID. Great. Thank you so much, Isabel, for um, this deep dive into UBIDs and developing the CBLs. Um, we are at the top of the hour and wanting to respect everybody's time, but appreciate all the additional comments left in the chat. Um, we envision this, as I mentioned, to be a quarterly cohort meeting. And so I think we'll set aside some time in our next meeting to kind of cover the bases we didn't today. Um, and uh, we'll also be kind of using the registration list from this meeting to conduct that outreach, um, you know, sending a direct calendar invite for that meeting um, that folks can kind of respond to based on availability um, or, you know, if they would prefer not to receive um, for the communications. But we really do appreciate everybody's time. Um, I know that EPA has a lot of good follow-up thoughts as well to share um, that we can convey via email. Uh, since Nazio has a hard stop as well. But um, yeah, any closing thoughts from either uh, Isabel or anyone else on the line? All right, um, hearing nothing. Oh, go ahead, Isabel. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I put the link to the GitHub repo for those who are interested in that um, in the chat and my email. Um, you know, we're at Enrel, we're here really to support and provide technical assistance for free to any of you guys who um, need it. So feel free to reach out to me or any of our colleagues at the EPA and DOE and other labs. Um, thanks you. Thank you for the invitation, Jasmine, for speaking today. Thank you, Isabel, um, for offering that. All right. Thanks all for your time. Have a great rest of your afternoon.